I am Tom Kauser, and uh, this is the 2 o'clock session on uh, Friday. And I'm talking about partnering with millennials and Gen Zs to grow God's kingdom. And I am in room 18? 18. I'm an old man, I forget where I'm at. Um, let's start with a word of prayer. Gracious Father, I just, I just pray over this group. Father, their people are passionate in their love for you and in their desire to share your good news. But yet we live in a world that's confusing. And uh, a lot of things happening that uh, we don't understand. And we're called to go to places that we don't want to go to. And yet we are your people. So help us to talk about how we can be your disciples, touching those um, who might not know you, especially those who are members of the millennial and Gen Z generations. Father, I just pray you pour out your spirit in this room. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, I got to start with a disclaimer, okay? I'm a DCE, and DCEs tend to be creative guys, and I'm also a writer, okay? So I, I'm going to say some things, and I've got a lot, I'm going to kind of give you a glimpse of the world that we live in and some of the challenges that we have. When it comes to the practical stuff, I'm going to ask you guys what's going on, okay? I can throw out a couple of ideas, um, but, but I want to hear from you, and I'm going to give the last 15 minutes for you to do that, okay? So if you're coming here and saying, this guy's got all the answers, he's got all these fantastic programs, I don't have those. But I can tell you this, I, have the, I, I would much rather hang out with millennials and Gen Zs than I would with senior citizens. <laughs> because they're a lot more fun, and they're a lot more open to sharing, and they're, they're believe it or not, they're a lot more positive. And if I hang out with, around with old people, people my age, all they want to do is talk about their aches and pains. And, you know, and they're, they're, they live in Psalm 42 because they praise God and then they go home and they grieve because we can't go back to that procession that we had in the 50s and 60s. You know. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. So, um, okay. Advance. So who is this old man, and why is he so passionate about millennials and Gen Zs? Let me tell you my story in a nutshell, okay? Uh, I already told you I'm a DCE. Um, I graduated in 1969. My plan was to, there's room down front if you want to sit on the floor. Uh, otherwise, you can stand in the back. Come on in. Um, I told him I needed a bigger room. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyway, uh, came back from student teaching, and my wife and I, my wife-to-be, met with the placement director, and he looked at me and he said, how do you feel about a youth ministry call? And I said, I really want to teach middle school, I want to coach basketball, and maybe on the side help with the youth group. And he said, sometimes God has other plans for you. The reality was, the DC program was brand new. And it's just like when a new model of an iPhone comes out, everybody lines up outside the store to get one. Well, that's what churches were. And there were over 20 calls for DCEs, and the school, Concordia Air Force, was graduating too. And so there were a whole lot of us that were round pegs that were put in square holes. Uh, but somehow God knew what he was doing, because I, did, I was in church congregational youth ministry for 26 years. I spent two years working for the Texas District, uh, 11 more years at Lutheran High School in Dallas as school counselor, and I got to live my dream. I was the varsity basketball coach. <laughs> you know, it was so cool. And, and you know, and for a guy, for a youth guy, uh, being in a high school setting was my dream because I was with kids five days a week, eight hours a day, 14 to 16 hours a day during basketball season, and you know, and I was. That was my glory years. But I knew in 2006 that the school was in trouble. Because we had gone from 325 enrollment down to 290, and every button of desk was $10,000. And we still had the same size faculty. 
I never thought I would be one of the victims, but I was, my position was eliminated. And at age 61, there I was. And nobody wants to hire a 61-year-old youth guy. <laughs> you know? And so I said, well, let's reinvent ourselves. And so over the last eight to 10 years, my passion has become how do we begin to minister to millennials and now how to minister to Gen Zs. And um, so it, that's, that's kind of my story in a nutshell and how it got me to this point. Um, I have done writing. This is my most recent book, Tear Down the Silos and Pitch a Tent. Um, it's about the church in the future. And I was tell sharing with somebody, I had this out on the table, uh, and uh, a young lady walked by and she picked it up. And she looked at me and she said, I was in your sectional two years ago, and I left there thinking, this guy is crazy. <laughs> and then COVID hit, and everything you talked about happened. You know? And uh, so that's what this book is about. It's, a, it's it, uh, the church of the future and how we need to adjust in the way we do ministry. And that's kind of what we want to talk about today. So, enough about me. And uh, there's a couple of family members in the room, so they, they, they could tell you probably even more. So, sorry if I embarrassed you guys. <laughs> Yes, we have a major problem. In 1970, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod had almost 3, 3 million members. Today, we're down to less than 1.5. Now, here is, and, and you know, and, and all the baby boomers are saying, what happened to our church? You know who to blame? The baby boomers. <laughs> Because my generation was the first one to go off to college. And when you went off to college, you were exposed to all these other different religions and cultures. And then the Synod did away with the Walther League, which was the Petri dish where, you know, Lutherans met Lutherans, you know, and the thing just grew. And suddenly, Lutherans were marrying Baptists, and Baptists were marrying Methodists, and Catholics were marrying Presbyterians. And what happens when there's you know, a marriage like that. They probably are going to look for some neutral ground. And that's when the non-denominational megachurches really have their roots. Yeah. And the mainline denominations all saw their decline beginning. Across the board, every mainline Protestant denomination is in decline. That's a reality. And we need to do things differently. Our facilities have been devalued. If you're in a church that has declining membership and has a mortgage, you've got a problem. You know. Plus, your building is probably you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years old, so it needs constant maintenance. And Here's another thing we need to think about. There's a pretty good possibility within the next 10 to 15 years, the churches are going to lose their tax exempt status and they're going to have to start paying property taxes. What is that going to do to our buildings? So that's why I say our facilities have been, there's no future in buildings, okay? There is when you worship in them, but there's no reason to be building new ones. Not when there's so many that are vacant. And there is a huge generational gap. I had a conversation with a, a young lady, uh, young lady, she's a little younger than me, so she was young. And I said to her, because she, she was talking about her church, and I said, so what percentage of your church is under the age of 60? And she said, I don't think we have anybody under the age of 60. And what does that do for the future of the church? And why is this so urgent now? Do we begin to think about how we need to be partnering with young people to do ministry? 
In-person worship attendance has declined by between 30 to 50 percent since February 2020 when COVID hit. And the most least likely to return are millennials and Gen Zs. Um, last week I spent three days at Camp Lone Star in Texas. Uh, I still go to the, the DCE retreat uh, every year. Well, you want to you go to a party, go to the DCE retreat. But I bail out about 9.30, 10 o'clock, because I'm an old man. But anyway, in talking with, I probably talked to 18 to 20 youth workers that were there. Across the board, they said, if we had 30 to 40 young people involved in youth ministry before COVID, we're down to less than 10. And the, the families that are not coming back are the millennial families. Yeah. And we keep thinking, well, they're just being cautious. They don't want to expose their kids to COVID. You know, I think in a lot of cases, they've kind of reevaluated their life. They've gotten out of the habit of coming on Sunday morning. And we say, well, they're probably watching online. But we don't know that for sure. So we have a problem. And, and when I saw this, I thought, you know, Tom, you, you, I had to su submit this su proposal six months ago. If I was su su submitting it now, the title of this section would be totally different because of what I know now. Uh, and this one scares me. So, two realities going forward. The traditional way that we've done ministry is not working in our current culture. And a top-down style of church leadership doesn't fly with millennials and Gen Zs are all, who are all into collaboration and working together. The top one the traditional, uh, what I call silo ministry, and the, 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 the title of this book comes from um, Abraham, and when Abraham went to a new place, what did he do? He built an altar, pitched a tent, and that's what God is calling us to do, to go into our neighborhoods, build altars there, pitch our tent, and gather people around us. Or to find places where the lost are gathered and go there and build relationships. Because expect to expect them to come to us is not going to happen. You know? The silo concept came from um, in the, for a long time we lived in Chicago my wife's family, my wife's parents lived in St. Louis, and so we were back and forth between Chicago and St. Louis all the time. And the Illinois Central Main Line is parallel to old Route 66 before Interstate 55 was built. And every time along I, or, you know, Route 66, there were grain silos, and there were always three, because you had corn and you had wheat and you had soybeans. That's what they grew in Illinois. And it's also it's the, also the edge of flatness. I mean, you can look across. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, but what I talk about is that if you looked beyond those grain silos, you'd see other silos in the town. There was a Methodist silo, there was a Lutheran silo, there was a Presbyterian silo, there was a Baptist silo, there was a Catholic silo, and everybody was inside of their silos. And in a sense, that's what we still have today, you know. Do we still do ministry that way? The ministry happens within that silo. And for decades it worked because we baptized children and then they went into the cradle roll and then they went into Sunday school and confirmation class and youth group and maybe we didn't see them for a few years because they went off and sold their wild oats in college but as soon as they were getting ready to marry they came back and they had kids. And they were baptized, and the cycle just continued to roll. 
it doesn't work anymore. You know? And traditional Sunday school is, is in decline. Traditional youth ministry is in decline. We don't have single young adult groups anymore. Yeah. We have fewer baptisms. Traditional parish ministry doesn't work. And with regards to the second one, um, it was an interesting observation that somebody made. Uh, we were talking this morning. Um, he said, have you noticed something about all these exhibitors here? Most of them are grassroots ministries. People have had a vision and a passion for something, and they, they've taken that and developed a ministry, and that becomes their ministry. And he said, they're very passionate about that, and they're doing good stuff. You know? They're educating kids in Guatemala. They're educating kids in Kenya. They're doing prison ministry. They're doing national park ministry. He said, and if you notice, those are all vibrant and alive. Why is that? And I said, well, that's because that's the way ministry should be. You know, I'm sorry to say it, but the good stuff does not happen from the top down. It happens from the ground up. And that's what we need to be thinking about. We need to be pitching tents among millennials and Gen Zs and you know, worshiping with them, gathering with them, praying with them. Let me tell you a little story. Um, I want to sit down. Story time with Tom. Okay, as a writer, I do a lot of my writing at Starbucks, okay? Because, it, because that's where millennials and Gen Zs hang out. And so uh, before COVID, I was going, you know, at least once a week, but usually two, twice a week to the Starbucks that's open close to where we live in Dallas. And um, so I got to know some of the staff there. And they were curious about what I did. Why was I showing up all the time? And when I go into Starbucks, the first thing I do is put my Bible down then open up my laptop. And, uh, and that's kind of a door opener because they want to know what I'm doing and what, you know. And, and so um, I started to learn a little bit about them and they called me Pastor Tom. I didn't want to go in to explain to them that I'm not a pastor, you know, but that's who I was to them. And uh, I even had an opportunity to pray with a young man who was struggling with an issue. And then COVID hit. And I couldn't go to Starbucks and write. I was stuck at home in the family room writing. Well, about three months into this, I was going by Starbucks one day and I saw that the drive through was open. I said, well, I'll just go through and get my, I was ordering the same thing, you know, Grande Pike is, you know, you know. And don't put anything in it. If God wanted cream and coffee to put it in there to start with. You know, <laughs> you know, you know. And don't put any of that fancy, you know, sugary stuff in there because I'm a diabetic and I should be, I, you know, so I live on coffee. So like, Starbucks is a great place to hang out. So anyway, I go through this, the drive through I made my order, got up to the window, and this girl starts to hand me my coffee, and she screams. And she said, it's Pastor Tom. And all of a sudden, where all these faces were in the window, and they wanted to know if I was okay, and they told me how much they missed me. See, that's what we need to be doing. We need to be out with those people, getting to know them, and when they see our faces over and over again, we have a relationship, and that leads to us talking about their life, and then they start asking about our life, and that's when we share Jesus. And we should be doing the same thing with our neighbors. My guess is we probably have at least two or three or four or five neighbors who are millennial families, you know, families of little kids. The one thing, good thing that came out of the pandemic was I learned my church family, I couldn't see anymore, but I could see my neighbors. And I started walking the neighborhood. And as I did, I met these families. And it, I live in a, kind of, a, a corner lot and there's a cul-de-sac down at the end. And in the afternoon, um, the moms would come out with their kids and they'd play in the cul-de-sac because it was a, like a big, you know, flat area in the street and it was safe. And the moms would sit on the curb and, and talk and the kids were playing in the street and dads would come home and, you know, and they'd join the, and I'd go down there and talk with them and it was great, you know. 
And that's what we need to be doing because they, our lives started to become intertwined and I found out some things that were going on in their lives. And they learned about what I do. That's what God is calling us to do. It's not difficult ministry, folks. It just means moving outside of our comfort zone. And when we do that, they come to know Jesus. And the doors open for them to begin to partner with us. So, three specific ways that we could be partnering right now. There's a national youth gathering this summer. You need to support it. Make sure your kids are going. And you need to help them pay that expense. It was interesting. Uh, about five years ago, I, I, I did time out. I need a water break. I'm getting dry. There's a member of Generation Alpha back there. That's what the next generation is going to be. Is that what they're going to be called? Alpha? Yeah. I love it. Um, I did a, uh, I did research for a book that never uh, came about. Uh, what I was curious in is why certain millennials were still involved in church. And uh, so I interviewed probably 50 to 60 millennials. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're good. Um, and uh, I found three common threads in terms of why those folks were involved when many of their peers were not and walked away from the church. The three common threads were a parent who was a model of discipleship for them. And it was mostly dads that they talked about. The second thing was they talked about at least one or two people at their church other than the pastor who influenced them in their faith walk. It could have been a, a you know, youth leader, could have been a music director, could have been a Bible class teacher. Maybe it was just a senior citizen who just took an interest in them. But that person made, held them accountable for their walk of discipleship. And, and that really ties into the whole sticky faith thing that, that was really big about five years ago, that every teenager needs three to five people, adults in their life, that will help them in their faith walk. Um, but the third thing that those people talked about was mission trips or youth gatherings, that they were life-changing. And once you go through something like that, your faith is much different than it was before. So that's one of the things we need to be doing. Number two, we need collaborative projects. And when I meet with a, when I talk to a senior citizens group, which I do get asked on occasion, although they usually don't invite me back. Um, <laughs> I look them in the eye and say, okay, what are you involved in here? Altar guild, you're the quilting ladies, you usher, okay? You, you know, you're the kitchen crew that, you know, at our church, uh, I go to Prince of Peace Lutheran Church in Carrollton, Texas. Uh, we have the Holy Smokers, you know, they smoke meat, that's their ministry. And they, 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 have, they have two fundraisers a year, all the money that they raise goes into Buying, them, buying their supplies and they do food events and don't charge anything. Um, but I ask those people, you're doing something that's really important and valuable. Who's going to be doing it 20 years from now? If you are not teaching some person to do that, some young person to do that, that ministry is going to disappear. And the quilting ladies need to be asking younger people to join them. 
And the ushers need to be looking for young people with, who are sitting in a pew and bring them alongside. All ministry needs to be collaborative. It's interesting, at, at, at our church, we have, um, they've, they've moved all of the, 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 the growth ministries under, under one umbrella. It's called uh, Faith at Home Team. So the, the youth, pet and youth ministry, children's ministry, um, community outreach ministry, senior citizens ministry are all working together. And so we as a congregation celebrate faith milestones. And families celebrate faith milestones. So one of the things that they do is uh, a confirmation. The parents have to be involved. And one of the confirmation projects is each confirmant makes a chalice. And for their first communion, they commune their family and then their family communes them and the whole congregation gets up and applauds yeah. Yeah. and there's you know and we're constantly celebrating faith milestones you know uh, as a church um, because we want to be cross generational the third thing we need to do is be honest and listen If I said, can you recite John 3.16, can you recite it? What about John 3.17? You know it? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, that, but that the world might be saved through him. Stand up and yell it at the group. Oh, but I already said it once. Yeah, <laughs> stand up and say it again. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Thank you. That's the key. That we're not talking to people and judging them, but that we're listening to them and getting to know their story, beginning to understand the context, and in spite of all the crap in their life, we say, Jesus loves you. Because there's crap in my life and he loves me too. When I was doing that research for the, that I talked about for the, the book that never came to be, um, Mark, you remember when you took me down to the, that coffee house down by, what was it, Union? Yeah. And I started talking to, to some folks there because I went back another time. And what I discovered that there was a huge ministry to gays and lesbians through that coffee house. And I started talking to some of those folks because they were, they, they, they was, this was a Christian coffee house. And they actually had a worship time there. And a lot of the people who were there were gays and lesbians. And what I was curious is, you know, where, your faith walk and why are you still involved? And hearing their stories helped me understand where they were coming from. Is their lifestyle wrong? Yeah. But so is mine. And when it comes down to it in God's eyes, I'm just as screwed up as they are. And he still loves me. God did not call us to condemn young people for their actions or for the things that they do. He called us to love them and to listen to their stories. And when we do that, we open the door for them to want to know more about us, and that's how we begin to collaborate in ministries. We must take the message to them because they won't come to us. Micah Miller, the senior pastor at our church, says that the church is, a, is an aircraft carrier where we land on Sunday morning are refueled and some maintenance is performed and we hear about our next mission and then we're launched to go on that mission. That's the way the church needs to be thinking about the future. 
that each and every one of us lands on that aircraft carrier on Sunday morning, is inspired and motivated, hears that their sins are forgiven, and they're launched to do ministry where they're at. And collaborating in ministry doesn't necessarily mean coming to church for a project. Integrity is vital. We need to learn to listen first, because without a relationship, nothing, no sharing can take place. So, and then digital discipleship is here to say, to stay. You know, and, and I shudder when I hear um, a church leader say. You know, we're looking forward to the day when we can stop the online worship and just worship in person. And I'm thinking, eh, yeah, yeah. And uh, I heard a, a, when I was at the D.C. conference, who's the D.C. that's at Lamb of God in, in Flowermount? No, I mean, in, uh, our Savior McKinney. Olivia. Olivia. No, her husband, the, the other one. Yeah. Anyway, he's a he's a pastor, and he has put together a, a, a series of YouTube videos. Mark Bray. Mark Mark Bray. Mark, yeah, Robin Bray's husband. Um, thanks, Mark. Um, and uh, digital discipleship is here to stay. Yeah, that we begin to have a presence online. Talking about the stuff that young people want to talk about. And that means talking about some of the tough issues. It might mean talking about critical race theory. And it might mean talking about Christian nationalism. And it might mean talking about homosexuality. And it might mean talking about living, out, you know, living together outside of marriage. But all those things should never keep us from being God's people and loving. And uh, so those are the kinds of things that we need to be generating discussions on and talking about. Um, today's young adults and teens have a desire to make a difference and they're seeking people who will come alongside them and help them to do that. Now, I want to open it up for, we have 20 minutes, and we'll use 15 of those for you to talk to, and now I'll give you a little commercial at the end. So, you got to stay for the commercial. There's nothing in between. I don't take a, doing a break in between for a commercial. I'm gonna, uh, what I got to talk about is, is really good, so. Hang around. Don't be leaving. Um, okay, talk to me. You can comment on the stuff that I've talked about, but what I want to re hear is some of your stories in terms of how you're collaborating. Oh, Go ahead. So, uh, in, in two minutes. Okay, okay. yep, yeah, I can be fast. Uh, so I'm a millennial, okay. and I am a university professor, so all of my students are Gen Z. Okay. So you're completely on point that uh, it's the relationship building that's the thing that is going to reach that younger generation because they already have all these preconceived ideas of what the church is. Mm -hmm. So coming at it from outside of that as their teacher, building a relationship with them, and then eventually uh, helping them grow as people and their studies and everything, and then it gets to a point where then they find out that I also work at a church, and then that opens a door to have okay. those, those kinds of conversations. How many of churches where you have comfort dogs? Any of you have comfort dogs? Have you involved the youth group at that all in that, that? How does that work out? Uh, fantastic. It's uh, three days a week between our high school and our elementary school. Um, and they both, I mean, they do like 
no questions. It's just walk up and pet the dog, and usually then the uh, the kids and even the high schoolers will just open up to our uh, our team mm -hmm. and, and just talk. So that's it. It's awesome. Yeah, and 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 there'll there'll be a desire along the way for them to get involved in that ministry as their as their time and schedule allows. Yeah. Yeah, a couple of them already have mm -hmm. joined in on that. Yeah. Yeah. When do you think we're gonna get to the point where we're gonna start using the pronoun we instead of the millennials, the Gen Z's and the baby boomers? When do you think we're gonna start doing that? The we well, we learn to use the pronoun we for all of us. Oh yeah. When when are we gonna start doing that? <sighs> Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know. We we tend to put labels on people. I mean, yeah. it's just, you know, are you a Republican or a Democrat? It's you know, important you're, to know, you know yeah, the differences, yeah. but still there's a weird. Yeah, yeah. And, and the generational terms, um, it's all about marketing. I mean, that, that's really what it comes down to. When, when, when people have a product to sell, they want to target a particular generation, and that's where a lot of that comes from, you know. Um, and it's not helpful for us in ministry because, yeah, it's 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 a we thing. Yeah. So, anybody else want to share? Yeah. I'm just thinking back to what you talked about um, the significance of adults in the life of a kid going to church. Mm -hmm. And I'm remembering um, after confirmation being forced to be a usher in my church. And um, so all of, all of us boys had to do that. So every, every week I went into stand at the door with this guy. Uh, this is a rural, um, rural congregation. And this guy, he could have been my dad. Every single week he just wanted to know what happened during this week. Just listen to me. And then I, you know, when, when I graduated from, from high school, and I'd come back, that same guy would come up to me, no I was no longer in Russia, and say, John, what's going on in your life? And to this day, if I go back to that church, um, that's the person <coughs> that I look for. Marge Kamishki was that person for me. The, the church that I grew up in, when you were confirmed, mm -hmm. you had a confirmation sponsor. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Marge Commissioner and her husband, but Marge was the one who did the, the dirty work. I, you know, and, but she made sure that, that, that I knew that I was loved. And I mean, I got cards from her and encouraging notes from her. Um, and when I would go back home, she would always, you know, she wanted to know what I was doing, and a very, very special relationship. And uh, um, yeah. um, so that's become important to me. Yeah. To call um, kids by name. And I don't know them. I'm not sure. To see if I can they are. You know, it, and it's it. Uh, I I do some. A little bit of con we rotate through in the confirmation the Sunday morning program um, at Prince of Peace, and um, so I'm, I'm in there at least a, you know a couple Sundays a year. But the relationship that I have with those kids and their parents, but there are certain young people who will seek me out every Sunday morning, and even if I, we don't talk, I you know, I see them and they we make eye contact, and I go, eh, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Anybody else? Yeah, go ahead. I'm just, I'm just thinking in the terms of the, what we've gone through in the last two years and what, what I've noticed. I, I have four Gen Z children. Um, I also do a college kind of outreach uh, ministry at our church. And you know, you, we all think, oh, well, they grew up with technology. They're used to communicating digitally. You know, that's the way they like it. And what I found is they didn't like that any more than any of us. Mm -hmm. They really needed that relationship, that in-person time, that, like everybody's saying, that person of interest, face-to-face um, <coughs> -face contact. And I think they realized during that time, many of us did as well, how much 
we need that, how important that is. Mm -hmm. They, you know, yes, we have digital reality is not going away, digital church is not going away, podcasts, whatever, but there, there's still that piece of wanting to be in person and wanting to get that hug and wanting to know mm -hmm. that, that all of us are still thinking about them in whatever kind of sense that is. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important. Yeah. More so, like, just a general question for you. So, in the beginning, when you talked about the decline in church attendance, specifically in the LCMS, um, you mentioned that there was a lot of intermingling between marriages and denominations. Uh, but then, when you talked about the, the silo approach, you walked down, you can see the Lutheran silo, the Catholic silo, the Presbyterian silo. I mean, how exactly do you, do you think the, the best approach is to one, honor the Lutheran heritage that's where most of us are coming from? Uh, but still recognize that we put ourselves so squarely in the silo that we're not going to be able to the ministry. One of the things I, I, I talk about in the book is that uh, in the future, uh, there's going to be three kinds of churches. Okay? There's going to be mega churches. You know, okay. There's going to be cornerstone churches. And there's going to be terminal churches. Cornerstone churches, I think, are, are the future for mainline denominations. Because they are, and you see some of it already in Baptist churches. How many of you have a Baptist church in your community that's no, no longer uses the name Baptist? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know, or, you know, when, you, when uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, my son's new uh, mission in, in the Baltimore area is called New Thing. And it's the Jeremiah passage. I, Bill, I'm doing a new thing. Um, so, cornerstone churches are the churches that probably right now are worshiping, you know, two, three, four hundred, you know, maybe less than that even, you know. But they're churches that get it, okay? So, they're engaged with their community, they have a missional mindset, they're cross generational. And as these churches that are in decline, the terminal churches start to go away, people who want to maintain their Lutheran tradition are going to go to those cornerstone churches. And even if, even if a denomination goes away, there still will be a Lutheran tradition. I don't see the LCMS going away totally, you know, you know because it's, it's too deeply rooted. But it's going to continue to get smaller and smaller and smaller. But those cornerstone churches are going to make sure that Lutheran theology stays alive and well. And uh, um, and then the fourth kind of church that I talk about in the book is a, is a legacy church. And that's a church that realizes their terminal, says, we're going to go away, but we want to leave a legacy. And we want to start something new. Yeah. And they acknowledge that and they go forward. Yeah. Um, and it's like we meet people, they seem very interested, and then they're like, but we already go to that church. And it's not so much an issue, my husband always talks about, we're not trying to church grab, right? We don't want to take people from another church. But at the same time, we've noticed more and more people going towards theirs, which is leaving more of a gap in our, we're a very outreach center mm -hmm. church. So if we don't have volunteers, we can't get the outreach. And people are kind of shifting and going to these mega churches. And um, I guess I'm just curious, and maybe anyone else You know, it was interesting in the, the 1970s, um, I was in youth, doing youth ministry in Chicago, 
and uh, there was a Chicago, there's a group of Chicago youth workers who got together, you know, a couple times a year, had, had training events and stuff. And I got to know a young pastor by the name of Bill Hybels. And Bill Hybels had this concept of, you know, mega church. You know, he, and it really was started in Willow Creek Theater. And it was a ministry to teens and their families. That's what really Willow Creek started. But watching Willow Creek grow, and when I took a call to the church in Dundee, Willow Creek was very was close to us in proximity, and everybody was up in arms. Everybody's leaving our church to go to Willow Creek, you know. And, but about three to five years down the road, we had people co coming back to us because they wanted the intimacy of a small community, you know. Um, and you know, and, and I think whether one of the things that we need to get over is is people who know go to mega churches know Jesus. Yeah. 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 And that's the important thing. Yeah. And we can't, you know, we, we need to, you know, and, and one of the things that we need to get beyond, um, I think there's one more slide. Oh, I went backwards. Well, while you're looking, uh, we're on the other side of the shadow of yeah. And we've kind of resolved that same thing. You know, there's, you see everybody migrating that way, and so it's the natural inclination. What we got to do is they're doing. But we don't have the resources to do what they're doing, you know, like human or monetary. So it's like, okay, how can we differentiate? And, and it really does boil down to what Tom was saying. Now, we, we still struggle. Like, you know, our kids come through confirmation, they get in high school, they go where their friends go, oh, they're going to. Willow, they're going to harvest or whatever. But we want to try and really um, zone in on the personal relationships that we can have in a smaller environment like that go a little deeper. So that's where our, our youth pastor is really taking and investing in the kids that are still there to like, you know, walk with them deeper as opposed to like in mass. So, it's like drive off your differentiation, you know, and find ways where you can get to go okay. deeper. In the Emmanuel Palatine. Yeah. yeah, I have terrible memories of that gym. I could never <laughs> win. A, I could never win a basketball game. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I, that we're known for that. Yeah, I I I, I did some co did some coaching at, at Emmanuel in Dundee. Yeah. And and uh, so, um, did I talk about this before? Okay. No. I get confused sometimes. Okay. Somebody, somebody will look this up. Somebody got a Bible app and read it for us. This is the Great Commission in uh, Acts, as opposed to the Great Commission we usually hear in in Matthew's Gospel. Who's got it? Okay. So when they come together, they asked him. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Did you hear that? Jesus is leaving. And he tells his disciples, gives them a glimpse of the future, and they, their thing is, are you going to restore the kingdom? And we ask today, Jesus, are you going to restore the church? <laughs> are you going to move us back to the way things were when we... I love Psalm 42 because it goes back and forth between praising God for his, you know, his, his love and compassion and presence and grace and lament. And the lamenting is over the way things were when we marched in procession to the, to the temple, to the synagogue. And when we lived in cities and had all these good things going on. And Jesus says, 
This is not about the kingdom. This is about me and you going out and telling people what you know. That's where your mission is. And that's what we need to be thinking about today. Use this X Great Commission. We're not going to take things back to the way they were. But God has awesome things in store for the future of the church. Because it's in this room. And you folks are motivated. And we're going to make a difference. But it's not going to happen within our church buildings. It's going to happen when we get out. So one other hand back here. What or who we name our church for pretty much determines our ministry. Uh, we studied this about 35 years ago, and we said we wanted to seek out and bring people into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And we looked at our name, and we wanted to know what our name said to the people we were trying to reach who were the non-Christians of our community. We're in the, we're in the Northwest Seattle area. And so we went to the mall, and our name of our church was St. Luke's Lutheran Church. And uh, so we went to people, if you're not a Christian, what is a saint? Well, it's a New Orleans football player, mm-hmm. or it's an outdated good guy. Lutheran, at a party, a woman asked me what I did. I said, I'm a Lutheran minister. She said, that's a lot like Mormon, isn't it? <laughs> you know, and Luke, another guy said, he must have paid for the church, and you named it after <laughs> But we had no Christ in our church, as in our name. And so people assumed we were a cult. And that's, you're not far behind that. I mean, the, the people we want to mm-hmm. touch look at us, and our name is the number one thing they're going to look at, whether they're going to you know, come in there or not. Okay. And so it, it's looking at our name, and so we changed our name. What do people want? They want community. Mm-hmm. And so we, we put Christ... That's the number one. That's who we stand for. Community is who we are, so we're the community of Christ. We never got rid of St. Luke's. We kept that as a sub to it. It, St. Luke's had a reputation that was about, well, what were you, 45 years old. And it was good in the community. So we did that, but it dramatically increased who came to our church, and it changed it. So... You can be a cornerstone church without losing your Lutheran heritage. We never changed anything that we virtually did mm-hmm. or what we yeah. thought. We just had a different name. So anyway, uh, I've got a table out there. I've got a few copies of Tarot on the side. They're five bucks. And I, don't, I don't make much money on my books. That's not why I do it. Okay. <laughs> this is what I want to tell you about, though. Um, <coughs> Tina, what's her name? How do you find Jason? Because John, you know Tina. Oh, Jason. Right. Yeah. No, Jason. T- yeah, Tina Jason. Yeah. Yeah, she and I have, have, have had conversations and we're going to partner on a ministry. And, and I want to share it with you. It's called, I left these out there. Uh, and maybe you pick one up. If you didn't see, come see me. It's called Ministry Mastermind. And we're looking for people who, who are, are, are at a church and they, they, they see the need, they see what's happening and the need to change, but they don't, they, they don't, feel, in, they, they don't feel they can do anything. You know, and T- Tina uses the term, uh, they're on a treadmill in a box. You know, a lot of pastors are that way. And they're, you know, they're doing ministry and they're getting pressure from, you know, the elders and the church council and all this. And their nose is to the grindstone and they see what's happening, but they feel powerless. You know. And Tina and I want to bring, you know, six to eight of those folks together to talk about what they're going through, begin to think about the future and even do, we'll even do some coaching with them so it'll begin to change. Um, and uh, so if you're interested in that, uh, I've got a card up here. You can, you can download, you know, the, 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 the information, the book. Um, but um, that's another opportunity um, to talk about the future of the church and, and ministry. Um, so... Um, 
Yeah. So my question is, I didn't grow up with a church necessarily until probably high school. <clears throat> my kids now are growing up in the church, and my husband's a pastor just recently, and we have a congregation that is predominantly 60 to 90, right? And so there have been times where I feel very like, man, if church looked like this when I was little, I'm really glad I didn't go. <laughs> um, and that's really vulnerable and sad, I'm not kidding. But how, is there a resource that you're aware of that I can grow in my parenting to be able to teach my kids without, I mean, there's tons out there, I've got some things. But do you have anything in your, the back of your mind from BCE to help implement a better view in this context that we're at currently? Obviously, we're trying to change the culture, but it's going to take time. Um, and I did really appreciate a comment over here who's, who talked about the one man that was very involved. I started to tear, actually, because I know who that is in our church for our kids. And it just reminded me, okay, there's hope, right? <laughs> um, but is there any resources that can help me really transition them into to understanding the value of this now? Do you have any, how old are your kids? So I have seven and eight and three. So I we was are the only young family. Oh, you're the only they family. They kind of wrecked their world. <laughs> they, but, changed, they changed their um, parenting room to the one handicapped bathroom because um, they had no family. So it's like that kind of a situation. Um, <laughs> but um, just any any resource to... I would, I would, the I would just start with, with a basic Sunday school thing, and just have Sunday school with with your kids. Okay. Yeah. And you know, and, and I, you know, and probably when they reach like fifth or sixth grade, sit down with the with the Lutheran Catechism, yeah. one on one, and talk and talk to the Catechism. Martin Luther wrote the Catechism for, for parents. Yes, I'm gonna go through it, and I saw the kids went out there. Yeah. I was so excited. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Here's my contact information. Uh, one other thing, I do a weekly newsletter. It comes out every Monday morning. It's topical, and I and I take, you know, things that are related to this. Like one of the mo mo most recent ones was, who are the influencers of today of Gen Zs? Who are the you know the the celebrities that they look up to and want to model their life after? What are those? What message are those celebrities sending? What can we learn from them? You know, so those are the kinds of things that I deal with. If you're interested in the newsletter, uh, all you need to do is write down your email address, and I'll put you on the list. Um, I think there's some looking around the room at some of the names. I know there's some people here who get it. So, uh, and uh, what? There's one. Right here. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. Uh, and that's what keeps me going. It's a you know it's a grind to put one out every week, uh, but I'm blessed with a wife who's a filter who says you can't say that, <laughs> uh, and who also um, proofreads everything that goes out that I do. So she's my editor, and uh, so uh, if you're interested in that, all I need is your email address. There's a pad up here. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I'm going to pray for us. Gracious Father, I pray over this group. May they go out here empowered to make a difference in the world. We are your people in ministry now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.